Welcome again. In this session, we are at John chapter 1, verse 1. Now, the book of John and the letters of John are very, very important books, and they're very, very peculiar books because we got John, who was the closest one of all of the disciples, the closest one to Jesus. And we see it in his writings. You know, we read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're somewhat similar. But you come to the book of John, and you see something quite a bit different than what you see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's because John was very, very close to Yeshua, very, very close to Jesus. And being close, he had this place in authority. He had this place of revelation that none of the other disciples had. So when we read this book, the book of John, we need to realize that we are basically getting the inside of the inside scoop, okay? Because I explained this before, you got uh, different levels of authority. You got different levels of, of, um, of uh, views and different uh, authors. You know, you got the people that say just the general public. Now, some of these documents are not even in the Bible. You know, some documents that are ancient documents written about Jesus are not even in the Bible. These people are people who are not part of the 12, okay? Then you've got above that, you've got someone like Paul, who wasn't part of the 12, but yet he had an experience with Jesus, and he um, he started preaching the gospel, you know, mainly to the Gentiles. But then above that in authority are the 12, okay? And so the 12 disciples has got more weight and authority in what they say than anybody else because they're the ones who walked and talked, and as even Peter said, they handled the Word of God, so to speak. You know, they they were there to hear Jesus. We don't even know if Paul actually heard Jesus in the flesh, even saw Jesus, you know, personally, you know, in, 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 the, in the flesh, so to speak, okay? So... In that 12, in that group of the 12, we got the three, which is Peter, James, and John, who had exclusive access. It was almost like they were premium members of of the disciples. They had exclusive access uh, into certain parts of Jesus' ministry that the others didn't have. They had exclusive access to the Mount of Transfiguration. They had exclusive access, you know, to uh, to come and, and, and go into the inner rooms and raise the dead. They had exclusive access in, in many other things. And we dealt with this. We talked about this many times throughout the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Out of Peter, James, and John, John was the closest with the Lord. And so his book and his writings are packed full of just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful truths. And we are so privileged to be able to actually have it in our hands, aren't we? So let's read this. And I'm going to I'm going to only read just a couple verses here because it is so powerful. And this is one of the most important things that all of you should understand. Everybody who considers themselves to be a follower of Jesus, this is one of the first things you need to start to understand, okay? Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, I'm going to go on in a different teaching. I'm I'm going to be talking about the Trinity. And so in this teaching, I'm not going to touch on that because that's a big subject altogether. But I'm going to talk about the Word of God and what that means. Now, if you go down to verse 14 in John chapter 1, we read, The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and lived among us. We saw his glory. Doesn't that bring to mind the Mount of Transfiguration? We saw his glory. Such glory as of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. We have a very, very powerful concept here. We have the Word of God, and we have the Word becoming flesh. Now, also in another book, the book of Revelation, we have John who describes Jesus as the Word of God. It says he had that name on him. He's called the Word of God, okay? So, this is a thing that that I really... Uh, that really struck me when I first became uh, a follower of Jesus, when I first really came into the fold, so to speak. And I'm going to share with you some of the most wonderful nuggets of spiritual gold that I've ever, ever seen in my life. And like I said, every one of you, 
should know this if you don't know this already. And those of you who do know this, I pray that God would just enlighten the eyes of your understanding even more. Give you more revelation into this and, and make you more excited about this than, than you ever have been before. What is the Word of God? What is the Word of God? You know, some people say that the whole Bible is the Word of God. Some people say that the Bible is not the Word of God. But what does it mean, the Word of God? Now, let's say we have a, a conversation among three different people. Bob says, oh, hi, how are you doing? Tom says, I'm fine, how about you? Susan says, I'm not doing very well. So in this conversation, what is the word of Bob? What is the word of, of Tom? And what is the word of Susan? The word of Bob is, oh, hi, how are you doing? You know, the word of Thomas is, I'm fine, how are you? And the word of Susan is, I'm not doing very well. Okay? So, the word of somebody is what they actually say. And even more deeper than that, what are they actually conveying? You know, uh, because you can take the word of Bob, so to speak, and translate it into different languages. And it would be still the word of Bob, but the word of Bob is not necessarily letters in lang a certain language, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's a... It's a form of communication. He's com com commu uh, communicating something to us. It's what he communicates, okay? So the word of Bob is what Bob says. The word of, of Thomas is what Tom says. The word of Susan is what Susan says. Now, the word of God is what God says, what he actually says, what are in the quotations of thus saith the Lord? For example, we can read the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we have. And you can say, what words are the actual words of Jesus? Well, if you have a red letter Bible, then the words of Jesus are in red. The words of Jesus are not the words of everybody. It's not every word that you read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, you know, are the words of Jesus. But the words of Jesus are what Jesus actually said, what's in the quotations. So the word of God is not everything surrounding the quotation marks. It's what's in the quotation marks, okay? When I first was drawn close to God, this was years ago, okay? When I first was drawn into the fold and I first started really following Jesus and first started really getting serious with God, I started reading the Bible, okay? And one of the books that you read in the Bible is, you know, the book of Psalms. You run across the book of Psalms. And let's go over now to Psalm 22, okay? Psalm 22. And this is a psalm that is quoted in, uh, in the New Testament as well. But let's read this, Psalm 22, verse 1. My God... My God, why have you forsaken me? Wait a second. These are the words of Jesus. This is the word of Jesus. This is the word of God. Psalm, Psalm 22, is a prophetic psalm written by David, but written from the perspective of Yeshua, from the perspective of the Messiah, from the perspective of God, okay? David wrote, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But what, who was actually speaking there? It wasn't just David speaking there. It was Jesus speaking there about a thousand years before he was crucified and he said the exact same words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then I read on in verse 1. It says, Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? And then I started to realize, wait a second. These are the words of Jesus. It's not cut. in. It's, it's not dissected here. We don't cherry pick here. 
verse 1 is verse 1. The first half of verse 1 are the words of Jesus, but also the second half of verse 1. Yes, we don't have this written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't have this spelled out for us in the New Testament, but Obviously, if you read this, this is a continuation of what Jesus said. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping you, helping me and from the words of my groaning? So these here are the words of Jesus a thousand years before he was born. And this, is, this brings another uh, thing on the table. And I'm not going to talk about this in, in great detail either because we just don't have the time. But Jesus existed from before the world was created. It says in the scriptures that he actually created the world. I mean, Colossians chapter 1, Paul said, by him all things were made. You know, and we read later on in the book of John also um, that it says that it, it was Jesus that created the world. Because by the word of God, all things were brought into being by Jesus. Remember, Jesus equals the word of God. Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus. Everything that God said is Jesus. Okay? Let's read on in, in Psalm 22. Verse 2. My God, I cry in the daytime, but you don't answer in the night season, and I'm not silent. So, again, let's stop here for a second. Think about him in the, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane crying out, groaning, and he's under, under so much stress, he's sweating blood. Way more stress than any of you have ever experienced, okay? No wonder why he said, why are you so far from, help, from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, what stress and duress that he was under, sweating blood. I'm sure when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was much more dramatic than what you ever see in the movies or what you think about when you, when you read the scriptures. Here we, we got a little bit more detail in Psalm 22. Verse 2 again. My God, in day, I cry in the daytime, but, but you don't answer. In the night season, and I'm not silent. Verse 3. But you are holy. But you are holy. You who inhabit the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. Remember, don't forget, these are the words of Jesus. When he said our fathers, he was talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. He was talking about David. He was talking about all the patriarchs. Don't forget, Jesus was 100% Jewish, okay? The fathers were the Jewish fathers of the faith, okay? Verse 4 again, our fathers trusted in you. These are the words in Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. That's why, uh, if you notice, I put them as the words in red. They trusted and you delivered them. See, now Jesus is invoking God's um, loyalty here. Jesus is invoking God's mercy here. They trusted in you. You delivered them. L listen to my groaning. Verse 5, they cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Remember when Jesus said this, it was from the perspective of the cross. It was, while, it was when he was crucified. You know, when he was crucified, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Which means, I know some people in, in, in modern day Christian circles today say, lift him up, and you know, talking about praising God, praising Jesus. That's not what Jesus was talking about at all when he said, the Son of Man be lifted up. Oh, if you lift me up, I will draw all men to me. You know, obviously, if you read the, 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 the scripture in context, you see that this is not what it means. Lifting him up meant to be crucified. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, he was made to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So here's a, a wonderful fact too. You've got you to realize, you got to grasp this, that Jesus, the sinless, the spotless lamb, became sin. He became sin on the cross. When he died, 
you know, he died so that we can look upon him and say, I am crucified with Christ. So that we can look and say, when he died, sin died. My sin died when he died. When he rose from the dead, a brand new man, a man that a lot of people didn't even recognize because he was so different. He rose anew. That's, that is how we are born again. We trust that when he died, our sin died. That's why it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, that if you, are come, if you come to the knowledge of the truth and you fall away, it's impossible to come back. Because if you, if you come to the knowledge of the truth, the real truth, I'm not talking about, there is times when you just stumble and fall and stuff like that. It says a righteous man will fall, and, but though he falls seven times, he will rise. I'm talking about getting stuck in, in, in living in a life of sin. That's why John said in his, in his uh, letters, he said, it's impossible for you to be born of God and uh, to be born of God, to be born again and sin. Okay? Those who really know the truth, those who really have the faith of God as the scriptures uh, talk about. I'm not talking about how corrupt Christian preachers preach today. Oh, you just got to say the sinner's prayer and you're okay. Oh, well, you just got to come to Jesus and he will no wise cast you out. That's not what the scripture says. He will cast people out for their sin. He said that in Matthew chapter 5. He also said that in Luke as well. Okay? Matthew chapter 7, excuse me, and, and also in Luke as well. So we need to realize that Jesus became sin for us. That's why he said in Psalm 22, I am a worm and no man. He became as the serpent. He became a serpent on the cross. He became sin for us. That's why he said, I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Because obviously, if you read the scriptures, the accounts of him being crucified, he was a reproach of men. Men in general, the general public was making a mockery of him, teasing him, mocking him, abusing him. He was a reproach of men, despised by the people. Verse 7, all those who see me mock me. Of course, this is Jesus on the cross. Again, reality check here. Look at it from, let's get in perspective here. This is David writing these words 1,000 years before Jesus was even born. Okay? Approximately 1,000 years before Jesus was born, he was writing these words. You, th you think they are the words of David. But David wrote it under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He wrote it as a prophecy. He was prophesying with his, with his pen. Verse 7, All those who see me mock me. They insult me with their lips. They shake their heads saying, He trusts in Yahweh. He trusts in Yahuwah. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him since he delights in him. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's exactly what they did to Jesus on the cross. They mocked him. Now, my point is through this whole thing is that the word of God is Jesus. Jesus is the word in the flesh. Everything that's prophesied is Jesus. Doesn't matter whether it's two years before Jesus was born, 200 or 2,000 years before Jesus was born, if it's a prophecy, if it, if it is either a prophecy or the words in quotation, thus saith the Lord, God said, the Lord said, it's Jesus. Because that is the word of God. What we're reading right now in, in, uh, in Psalm chapter 22 is the word of God. It is Jesus. You want to know more about Jesus? You want to know more about what he said, what he was like, what he thought? Read the word. Understand what you're reading. Are you reading something like the historical books, which sometimes doesn't have quotations of what God said? Sometimes it's not really prophetic word, but it's just a historical account? Or is it a prophetic, prophetic word like the Psalms are? Or like, you know, a lot of things that uh, Moshe wrote in the Torah. Uh, so a lot of things that what the prophets wrote, thus saith the Lord. Okay? So everything you read in the Old Testament that is prophesied or is, that is the word of God that's quote, quoted, as, this is what God said, that is Jesus. Okay? Let's continue. You brought me out of the womb. This is verse 9. You made me trust while I was at my mother's breasts. I was thrown on you from my mother's womb. This is talking about the dedication. When Jesus came to the temple and he was dedicated as a baby. From, the mother's, from his mother's womb. He was born and he was taken right to the temple. Remember? 
Remember Simeon? You are my God since my mother bore me. Remember how he has always followed God as a child? He, you know, even as a child, he was left behind at the, at the temple and he, he wanted to stay at the temple in the house of God. You know, and if again, we're going to get into the more of what they call the New Testament Apocrypha, some of the books that are not included in the New Testament canon, which goes into a whole lot more detail into Jesus' childhood, which is also very interesting. Let's, let's read on. Don't be far from me, for trouble is near, for there is no one to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Now, again, you need to understand that in the Jewish mind, non-Jews are animals, okay? Non-Jews are animals. We got in the, in the book of uh, Acts when Peter had the vision of the, um, the sheep being let down with all kinds of unclean animals on it, and God said, kill and eat. And he said, no way would I kill and eat, Lord. I mean, if... A lot of people think that Jesus taught that, uh, you know, the, the, the gospel is that, uh, you, you know, you don't have to follow the Torah anymore. If that's the truth, why did Peter not know it in the book of Acts? Why did Peter say, oh, no, after hanging out with Jesus for years, after hearing every word he said for years, after hearing everything that Jesus said, after hearing and reading the scriptures and hearing the words of the Lord with his own human ears, with his own human eyes seeing him, don't you think he would know? But it's very clear in that context that God made it clear. No, 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 I'm not talking about literally killing an unclean animal and eating it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about unclean animals as in the Gentiles. Non-Jewish people will be made clean by my, by my salvation. They will repent of their sins. They will come into the fold. They will be part of the so-called mixed multitude, as we saw in the book of Exodus, when a lot of the other mixed multitude, the people who weren't really biological Jews, came out with, with, uh, with the children of Israel and were saved with them. So, many bulls have surrounded me, said Jesus. That's talking about the non-Jews. That's talking about the Gentiles. That's talking about those who are just animals and don't even live for God, don't even know God, okay? Now, to get into it a little bit deeper, and I'm going to put this bug in your ear as well. If you read the book of Enoch, okay? The book of Enoch is actually in the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Bible. It has been since the beginning, okay? Um, the book of Enoch explains what each animal, what, what nation it stands for. A bull stands for this nation. You know, a sheep stands for this nation. A dog stands for this nation, okay? We'll get, we're going to get into that as well, okay? So hang in there. Jesus said, Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open their mouths wide against me. Think about him on the cross. This is, ex this is explaining exactly what happened on the cross. Jesus was hanging on the cross. Remember, he was torn apart beyond recognition bloody like a just a piece of raw meat hanging there you can hardly recognize him it says in the book of isaiah he was so beaten he was so torn apart you couldn't even recognize you couldn't even recognize him okay here he is hanging there by the way completely naked torn apart ble bleeding like crazy and these people going around him shouting and making a mockery of him Verse 13, they opened their mouths wide against me. Lions tearing prey and roaring. I am poured out like water. Yeah, well, anybody would go through that would say the same thing. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. No wonder, because they beat him so hard. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. That's because of lack of, lack of blood. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. That there is speaking about thirst. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? He cried out, I thirst. I'm thirsty. They gave him vinegar to drink. And don't forget, the vinegar they had back then wasn't the food-grade vinegar of today, okay? It was a whole lot worse than that. Let's continue. You have brought me into the dust of death. For dogs, here we go. We talked about bulls. Now we're talking about dogs. For dogs have surrounded me. A company of evildoers have enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. How much more clearer can you get than that? 
They have pierced my hands and my feet. This is David speaking thousand years before Jesus was born. This is the word of God. This is the word of God that became flesh. Jesus is the walking, talking word of God. Everything you read in the, New, in the Old Testament, the so-called Old Testament, everything you read that is spoken of by a prophet such as David or that is in quotations such as, thus saith the Lord, is Jesus. You want to know Jesus more than what Matthew, Mar Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells you? Read the Bible from cover to cover. Genesis through Malachi and then some. Everything in the scriptures, every, everything in the, in the Holy Scriptures is Jesus, especially in the quotations, okay? Especially when prophesied. It's the word of God. Verse 17, I, I can count all my bones. That's how much he was torn apart. His flesh was hanging. His, they tore his muscles off of him. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. There we go again. Very clear in the New Testament. This is exactly what they did to Jesus on the cross. They divided uh, his garments among them. That's, uh, again, that's why I said he was naked. They took all the garments off of him. Okay. By the way, there is a, there is a church in Germany that, that claims that they still have one of those garments, and they have it on display every now and then. So it's very interesting to know that even today, there are people who claim to have those very relics. These relics are still in existence today. Let's read on. They cast lots for my clothing. <laughs> Again, how much more clear do you want it? I mean, this is Jesus on the cross. Verse 19. But don't be far off, Yahweh. Don't be far off, Yahuwah. You are my help. Hurry to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my, life, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. Yes, you have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. No, what's he talking about that? What, what's he mean? I will declare your name to my brothers. He knows he will be raised. He's, this is talking about now resurrection. I will declare your name to my brothers. Now, can I take it a step further? His brothers are the Jewish people. And he will. The time is still coming when he will be revealed once again to his people. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. The revelation, the revealing of Yeshua HaMashiach. Let's read on. I will declare your name to my brothers. Among the assembly, I will praise you. He, he is very, very confident here that he will be raised from the dead. Verse 23. You who fear Yahuwah, you who fear Yahweh, Praise him. All you descendants of Yaakov, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. I want to bring to your mind, I want to bring it to your attention that the word humble in the original Hebrew is very closely tie tied to the word afflicted. Those who are humble are those who are afflicted. Those who are afflicted are those who are humble. If you're not afflicted very much, there's a very good chance you're going to get some pride in you. You're going to get proud. You're going to get a lot of self in you, okay? In that light, let me read that verse one more time. Verse 24, For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. God hears the cries of the humble. Remember, it says over and over again in the scriptures, time and time again, so-called Old, so-called New Testament, over, <laughs> doesn't matter, it says it in both. God opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. You got pride in your heart? He opposes you. If you look that up in the original, it's talking about 
God sets himself up in battle formation against you. That's just what the scripture says. I'm just telling you what the scripture says, okay? It says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud but, but gives grace to the humble. A lot of people claim grace, but they've still got pride in them. A lot of people claim grace, but they're not humble. Let's go on. Verse 25. My praise of you comes in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The humble shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise Yahuwah. They shall praise Yahweh who seek after him. Let your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to y y Yahweh. All the relatives of the nations shall worship before you. That's talking about the Gentiles coming in. Verse 28, for the kingdom is Yahweh's. For yours is a kingdom, right? He is the ruler over the nations. All the rich ones of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust, that's dying, by the way, shall bow before him. Even he who can't keep his soul alive, posterity shall serve him. Future generations shall be told about the Lord. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness to a people that shall be born, for he has done it. When I first came to know God, when I first came to know Jesus and first started following him, the whole idea of the word, what's the word? And the word became flesh. The word equals Jesus and Jesus equals the word and the word is Jesus and the Jesus is the word. This started really started unfolding before me like never before. Let me read one more passage to you. One more Psalm to you. Just so you get the idea. Okay. This will bless you. Psalm 69. Psalm 69. Now this again is a psalm from the crucifixion. This again are the words of Jesus. How do I know they're the words of Jesus? Well, you're going to find out. But they are the word of God because David once again prophesied as he wrote this. What he wrote wasn't just the words of David. They were the words of Jesus. Verse 1. Save me, God, for the waters have come up to my neck. And once again, remember how Jesus prayed. He prayed like this. He prayed like this in the, gar the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed like this on, more or less on the cross. Why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is asking for salvation. Okay? These are the words of Jesus. Not just the words of David. Not just the words in a, in a psalm. These are the words in red. These are the words of Jesus. Save me, God. Uh, no, as I read this, I challenge you, picture Jesus on the cross. Picture him on the cross, beaten, mocked, a total mess, almost dead. Picture this. Verse 1, picture Jesus speaking this. These are the words of Jesus. This is what Jesus actually said with his own mouth. At least this is what he prayed in his heart. At least, save me, God, for the, wor for the waters have come up to my neck. Once again, you need to understand that the waters are symbolic of death because the waters are symbolic. It's baptism, and baptism is a, sim, is a symbolic of death. Okay? So he's about to go under, which means he's about to die. Save me, God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire. Again, this is figuratively speaking. Where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. He knows death is right there. I am weary with my crying. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? My throat is dry. Remember he was thirsty? My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Remember the, the crowd, the, the multitude of people? Crucify him. Crucify him. Everybody there crying, crucify him. And he says in verse 4, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who want to cut me off, being my enemies wrongfully, are mighty. I have to restore what I didn't take away. 
Jesus came to restore what he didn't take away. Verse 5. God, you know my foolishness. Once again, you might say, how, did, how would Jesus say he's foolish? Remember, Jesus became sin on the cross. Remember, he became almost like darkness. He said, I'm the light. But remember, from the Garden of Gethsemane, actually probably before that, from the, from the Last Supper, when he told Judas, go. You know, this is the hour of the power of darkness. Go do what you have to do. From that time is when he started more or less morphing or started more or less transforming into, into sin. Remember when he was in the garden, he was like, God, I don't want to go through this, but not my will, but yours be done. Now, that sounds a little bit different than the Jesus we read about before the Last Supper, doesn't it? Sounds like he's got, he's kind of struggling there, right? God, you know my foolishness. Yes, even Jesus himself becoming sin he became everything that sin stands for. He became that serpent on the pole, as he even said about himself. He became sin, as Paul said. He became sin on the cross. He became foolish. He became dark. He became night. He became a serpent. He became sin for us and died so that we can look, so that we can look upon his death. We can look upon the cross. We can say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. All of my my old life is dead. Sin is dead. That's why I can't sin no more. Foolishness is, is gone. It is done. Be, uh, right now, I am in the wisdom of God because I died with Jesus. And I rose with him. I'm really, truly born again. So here he was on the cross saying, God, you know my foolishness. My sins aren't hidden from you. Okay. Once again, he took the sin, as, as a lot of these modern day Christians and a lot of day, modern day preachers preach today, Jesus took our sins. He took them as his own. He became sin. My sins aren't hidden from you, he says. Verse six, these are the words of Jesus on the cross. Don't let those who wait for you be ashamed through me, Lord Yahuwah of armies. Don't let those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, God of Israel. Because for your sake I have borne reproach. Here we go again. Shame has covered my face. No wonder he's completely naked and everybody's mocking him and spitting on him, beating him. He went through it. Verse 8, I have become a stranger to my brothers. Mm -hmm. Yes, he has. Remember, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. His brothers, his brothers also, speaking here, are just the Jewish people. He became a stranger to, his, to the Jewish people. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's children. Hmm. Remember, they all stood afar off. For zeal, for the zeal of your house consumes me. Ah, there's another one. Remember he said that? Remember it says that in the scriptures? For the zeal of your house has consumed me. That's when he went through the temple and he cleaned it out. The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Ha ha, he's taking it for us, right? Verse 10, when I, when I wept and I fasted, that was my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I do not believe that this is ne necessarily talking about literal, physical, material sackcloth. He's talking about this in a spiritual sense. Sackcloth was more or less burlap, okay? When people in the ancient days, when they wanted to humble themselves as a symbol of humility and afflicting themselves, remember, humility and affliction is twins um you know remember humility and affliction are twins so uh, when people wanted to afflict themselves they would fast and wear sackcloth and sit in ashes sit in ashes reminding them that everything will become nothing but ashes that the things of this world that the material things that the lust of the eyes lust of the flesh will just end up to be ashes anyway okay so, and then they wore sackcloth. They wore like the worst kind of most uncomfortable clothing you can ever imagine, like wearing burlap. Can you imagine wearing burlap, you know, t-shirt, <laughs> burlap uh, robe, burlap shirt, pants, burlap underwear. Can you imagine wearing, wearing this kind of stuff? Imagine how uncomfortable that would be. But that is a symbol of afflicting yourself, of, making, of showing God that you're, you're, you're uncomfortable in yourself, that you're humbling yourself. So when Jesus said, when I made sackcloth my clothing, he was talking about just being very afflicted, very humble here. Verse 12, those who sit in the gate talk about me. I am a song of the drunkards. 
He was mocked, remember? He was mocked. Verse 13, but as for me, my prayer is to you, Yahuwah, in an acceptable time. God, in the abundance of your loving kindness, answer me in the truth of your salvation. Once again, he's begging God to answer him. Verse 14, deliver me out of the mire and don't let me sink. Remember, Jesus said, take this cup from me. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Don't let the flood waters overwhelm me. Neither let the deep swallow me up. Don't let the pit shut its mouth on me, the pit being the grave. Verse 16, answer me, Yahuwah, answer me, Yahweh, for your loving kindness is good. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, turn to me. Don't hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Answer me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Ransom me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. All my adversaries are all before you. My reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. He was all alone. No comforters, no pity, nothing. Verse 21. They also gave me poison for my food. What did they give Jesus on the cross? They gave him gall. That was poison. In my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Verse 21, there we are. In my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. These are the words of Jesus. These are the details you don't read about in the Gospels. These are the details you don't read about in the Gospels. For those of you who love the Lord, for those of you who seek his face, this ought to make your heart jump. And may I submit to you that all of the Psalms are like this. All of the Psalms. I'm just giving you a few examples. All of the Psalms are like this. When you read the Psalms, think about the life of Jesus. Think about the crucifixion of Jesus. Think about Jesus being, becoming sin for us. Think about the resurrection of Jesus. It's all there. It's all there. Jesus said very clearly, it's everything that's written in the law, everything that's written in the Torah of the prophets and of the Psalms, it's all me. It's all me. It's all me. You want to know Jesus more? You want to know Jesus better? Read the Torah, read the Psalms, read the prophets. It's all there. Verse 22, let their table become like a snare. Ha <laughs> ha. See, he's praying against his enemies here. Note that. He's praying against his enemies here. He said in verse 22, let their table before them become a snare. May it become a retribution and a trap. So he's praying against his enemies. He's praying against those who mock him. He's praying against these people, saying, let it become a trap to them. Let it become a snare to them. What's a snare for? It's a trap to catch, to catch animals, to really just to take their life. Verse 23, Jesus goes on to pray against his enemies. I know a lot of people think that Jesus was just this ever so hyper nice loving height you know never ever pray against anybody never ever curse anybody oh yeah read the scriptures my friend read the scriptures he cursed individuals he cursed groups of people he cursed entire cities and in fact it says when he comes back to earth he will massacre people that's what the scripture says okay that is what the scripture says he's coming back to tread up tread out the wine press of god's fury and the blood will come up to the horse's bridles it says in the book of revelation in, in, Book of Daniel talks about it a lot. Lots of the different books of Scripture talks about what, what Jesus is going to do when he comes back. And I guarantee you, my friend, he's not going to hug trees. He's praying against his enemies again. Verse 23, let their eyes be darkened so they can't see. Let their backs be continually bent. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let the fierceness of your anger overtake them. Remember, this is Jesus talking. This is the Jesus you don't hear about in the modern day corrupt Christian pulpits today. Verse 25, let their habitation be desolate. Let no one dwell in their tents. Let the fear of God come into your heart. If you don't, if you do not have the fear of God, if you do not obey God, if you get on his dark side, he can make you desolate. Jesus himself can be praying this against you. Right here, he prayed it against countless people. Some of these probably were people who followed him, at least from a distance. You need to fear God. Again, verse 25, let their habitations be desolate. No, let no one dwell in their tents. 
Their tense here being symbolic of homes. Verse 26, for they persecute him whom you have wounded. In other words, you wounded me, now they're persecuting me. In other words, they're, they're making it much worse for me. They tell of the sorrow of those whom you have hurt. They're making it worse. They go spread the news. They go spread the gossip about, about, about all the stuff that you're doing to me. Verse 27, charge them with crime upon crime. Don't let them come into your righteousness. Oh boy, isn't that something? Verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of life. Note this, these people had their names written in the book of life. If they didn't have their names already written there, why, how would they be blotted out? Their names were written in the, in the book of life. But Jesus here is praying that, it will, that their names will be blotted out. And not written with the righteous. But I am in pain and distress. Let your salvation, God, protect me. I will praise the name of God with a song. Here again is talking about resurrection. And will magnify him with thanksgiving. It will please Yahweh better than an ox. In other words, to sacrifice an ox. Or a bull that has horns or, and hoofs. The humble have seen it and are glad. doesn't say the proud have seen it. It says the humble have seen it and are glad. Maybe the, proud, maybe the proud did see it, but they weren't very glad. It says, the humble have seen it and are glad. You who seek after God, let your heart live. Again, he's praying. He is pronouncing salvation upon all those who seek God. That means, my friend, when you got time, don't waste it. When you got time, don't listen to all this vanity you see on TV or the, or the internet. Don't listen to all this vanity. Use that time. Use that energy to seek God. Remember, your time is limited. Your energy is limited. Don't waste it. How many people will be weeping and weeping and weeping when the day comes and they look back and they see how much time they've wasted? Verse 33, for Yahuwah, Yahweh, Hears the needy and doesn't despise his captive people. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves therein. For God will save Sion and build the cities of Yehuda. They shall settle there and own it. They are beginning to do that, by the way, in the land of Israel. The children also of his servants shall inherit it. Those who love his name shall dwell therein. So there's a couple of examples. What I've went through with you is just a couple chapters of Psalms. I challenge you to read all the Psalms. And as you read it, pray, God, show me Jesus in this. Show me his life. Show me his death. Show me his crucifixion. Show me his resurrection. Show me his ways. And you'll see that a lot, most if not all of the Psalms, are the actual words of Jesus himself. And also, look at other books right from Genesis. I mean, let's go back. You go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's just like John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But in the first chapter of Genesis, it goes on to say, God said, let there be light. Oh, there we go. Quotations. There's another example. Quotations. That is the word of God in the quotation marks. That's what God said. Let there be light. Or light be. Light exists. Remember, Jesus came around and said, I am the light. God said, remember also God said in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, let, you know, the tender plant, let, let the tender plant shoot up from the ground. Well, look at uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. Speaking of Jesus, it says, He grew up before him like a tender shoot. Or like a tender plant. Like, a, like a, um, in other translations, it says a tender shoot, a, a tender plant. So Jesus is that tender shoot. 
God also said, let, let, you know, let there be animals. He said, you know, let, uh, let us create the animals. Well, remember, Jesus was our sacrificial lamb. He was our sacrificial ox. You know, he was that sacrifice for us. It also says in the book of Genesis, God said, let us, let us make man in our image. Jesus is the man made in God's image. So everywhere, I'm, I, I'm not going to go through everything. Of course, it's gonna, that would take thousands of hours to go through everything. But I want to put this bug in your ear. Every time it says in the scriptures, God said, the Lord said, you know, whatever. Every time it says, God said, the Lord said, in quotations, thus saith the Lord, that is Jesus. At least the essence of what is being said is Jesus. That's the word of God. And Jesus is the word in the flesh. Finally, I want to leave you with one more, one more point. Remember, the word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. The Torah is the word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the Torah. And the Torah, as we read in the books of Moses, is Jesus. Remember, Jesus rebuked people for saying, you know, you have read these scriptures. They all speak of me. Remember, Jesus said very clearly, time and time again, the books of Moses, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms speak of me. He said very clearly, they speak of me. So you want to know what Jesus is like? Read the Torah. It's everything that, G that, that God said in the Torah is Jesus. You want to be more like Jesus? Obey the Torah. Hello. One plus one equals two. Two equals two. One equals one. Jesus equals the word. The word equals Jesus. The Word is the Torah. The Torah is the Word. Jesus is the Word in the, in, in the flesh. The Torah is Jesus. Jesus is the Torah in the flesh. He is the living, breathing, walking Torah. He's not a new Torah. He's the same old Torah. Remember God said in, in talk about Psalms, Psalm 119, He said, Your Word is forever settled in heaven. Forever settled in heaven. When David wrote your word, what word was he thinking about? I guarantee you, when David sat down and wrote, you know, your word, O God, is forever settled in heaven, he was obviously talking about the Torah being the word of God. The Torah is forever settled in heaven. Malachi 3, 6, God said, I change not. He made it very clear. I don't change. I'm not like different in the Old Testament than I am in the New Testament. I'm not like different 2,000 years ago than I was now, than I was 4,000 years ago than I am, than I will be in another 1,000 years come. No, he never changes. It's going to be the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As you read the Bible, I challenge you to read it in a different light. Pray, God, show me Jesus here. Pray, God, show me the crucifixion here. Show me the resurrection. Show me more about Jesus. And he will. He will. If you pray and you seek him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And as a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, you need to follow Jesus. You need to do what Jesus did. You need to become more like Jesus. I mean, most Christians that I know of, that's, they would say amen to that. That's their goal. Become more like Jesus. You want to become more like Jesus? Read the Torah. Read the old prophets. Read the book of Psalms. You want, to become, you want to become more like Jesus? Obey the commandments that we have given to us in the books of Moses. Obey the commandments and the instructions that are given to us through the prophets, through the Psalms. That's Jesus. That's the Word of God. That's who Jesus is, the Word in the flesh. If you hear about any kind of Jesus that looks a little bit different than what you read about in the books of Moses, I guarantee you that's not the true Jesus. 
As you go, may God enlighten your heart, give you revelation beyond all your peers, and show you great and mighty things. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, thank you.